You may be seated and let's turn to 1 John chapter 2, tonight beginning with verse 7. How can I be sure of my relationship with the Lord that it is genuine? I can't really trust in my feelings. Feelings can change. I can't really trust in the word of man. Throughout the Bible, there were always those false prophets that were giving false assurance. At the time that they were ready to be taken as captives into Babylon, there were those false prophets who were saying, peace, peace, and there was no peace. How can I be sure? John gives to us different tests by which we can know for sure that our relationship with the Lord is solid, it is genuine. The first test, he tells us here, is the test of obedience. If I truly know him, I will be obedient to him. As John said, hereby we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. In verse 3, John said, if we say that we know him and do not keep his commandments, then we are liars. The truth is not in us, so I can't really trust what I say. I might be deceiving myself. But if we are keeping his commandments, then his love is being perfected in our hearts. So the second test is God's love is being perfected in our hearts. In verse 5, John says, But whoever keeps his word, the love of God is being perfected in him. And hereby we know that we are in him. And so John tells us there in verse 7, Beloved, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which you've had from the beginning. It seems that man is always seeking to make new commandments, setting up new rules. God originally gave us 10 commandments. But then as time went on, they developed what they called the Mishnah. And it was the oral tradition that was based upon the commandments as in the Mishnah, uh, they tried to then uh, enlarge upon the commandments, explain them, uh, give examples of. And the Mishnah, the oral traditions, then developed into the Talmud. And ultimately, there were 67 volumes in the Talmud to explain the Ten Commandments. That's how man is able to sort of enlarge. God sort of set it out rather simply, but uh, man in trying to then define it and to uh, amplify it, developed the 67 volumes in the explanation of, of what God meant when he said, Jesus, rather than confusing things by adding and adding and adding, reduced the Ten Commandments. He reduced it to just two. Love God completely and love your neighbor as yourself. One day that lawyer came to Jesus and he said, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? 
And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And this is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, and on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. It's all summed up in this. Paul sort of concurred with that. In Romans 13, 8, he said, Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loves another has fulfilled the law. In Galatians, he wrote, For all of the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. All of the rules, all of the laws can be summed up very simply. Just love your neighbor as yourself. James said, if you fulfill the royal law of the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, you do well. So uh, James calls it the royal law. But this business of adding to the law just doesn't seem to stop. There are new laws that are being enacted daily. It used to be that here in the state of California, most of the new laws would go into effect at the first of the year. And, and when they create a new law, that usually is on the first of the year, this law will go into effect. Well, they are creating so many new regulations and new laws that they don't just put them into effect now on the first day of the year, but they also go into the effect on the first day of July. And this year I read the list of new laws that went into effect on the first of July, and it's amazing. You can't just put them all in, in January anymore. You gotta split the year up, and we've got so many new laws. But isn't it interesting? We have city councils that are there every week devising new ordinances by which we are to live. But then we have the uh, county supervisors, and they are creating new laws all the time uh, that will apply to the county. But then you have the state and its legislature, that is legislation that is creating new laws for the state. But then you also have the federal government. And these guys are back there creating new laws. It used to be the land of the free and the home of the brave. But, uh, you know, we are getting more and more restrictions all of the time by the new laws that are being in, enacted. I guess they figure if we pay them, they ought to be doing something. And so uh, they are devising new laws and regulations to... Uh, regulate our lives more and more. But the Lord has a way of just simplifying. He says, if you love, that's the key. If you love God with all your heart, that encompasses the first four commandments. They're all fulfilled if you just love God completely. The second six laws of the Ten Commandments would be fulfilled if you just loved your neighbor as yourself. That would, you would qualify to have kept the second. Interesting, you know, when you talk about marriage, uh, there are so many rules for marriage, rules of communication and rules for this, rules for your finances and rules for all of this kind of stuff. But it's interesting to me that the Lord just gives you two. He knows that we are prone to forget if we get too many. <laughs> now let's see, what was number 17, <laughs> section 2, you know, and uh, subset section A, and, you know, you can forget them. The Bible just tells husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. One rule for the husbands. Oh, what a happy marriage they would all be 
if your husbands love the wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Very simple. One rule for the wives. Wives, submitting yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Oh, how peaceful marriages would be if wives would just <laughs> obey that one rule. But you see how they are tied together. The wife said, well, I would submit if he just loved me like Jesus loved the church, you know. And he says, well, I would just love her as Jesus loved the church if she would just submit to me, you know. And so we have the, the problems that develop in marriage, but you can always trace them back to the failure of not keeping the rules, simple as they are. Husbands, all you have to do is just love your wife as Christ loved the church, and you'll find that she'll be putty, melt in your arms. She'll be feeling secure. She won't feel that she has to challenge everything that you do. She'll have that kind of confidence that if things don't go right. You're not going to take off. Simple. But we make it so complex. We really don't need new laws. We need to just keep the old commandments that we've received from the beginning. As John says there, I write no new commandment unto you, but the old commandment which you have from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning. What we were taught in the beginning is that our true faith is demonstrated by our love for God and our love for one another. The Bible says there are three abiding things, faith, hope, love. But the greatest of these is love. But then he says, and it seems almost contradictory to what he has just said. Again, he said, a new commandment I write unto you. Now, he just said that he didn't write a new commandment, and now he says that he is writing a new commandment. It sounds like a contradiction. What does he mean? I think that we've just covered the issue. The old commandment that we had from the beginning became so bogged down with amendments and interpretations that it really lost its meaning. They were so involved in trying to understand what constitutes bearing a burden on the Sabbath day and, and listing all of the various things that would constitute bearing a burden that they, they just forgot that uh, the law just simply said, you know, Keep that Sabbath day holy unto the Lord. And that was sort of overlooked by the fact that, well, you're not to bear any burden on the Sabbath day, and what is bearing a burden? If you have a wooden leg, can you wear it on the Sabbath day, or is that a burden? And, and they went down this litany of things that would constitute bearing a burden. False teeth. Bearing a burden on the Sabbath day. Can't use them on the Sabbath day. It's bearing a burden. And, and this kind of stuff. And, and they lose the meaning. They lose the thought. They, they lose the basic kind of, of, of commandment that it was so simple in the beginning but now has become so complex. Jesus said to the Pharisees in Matthew 15.3, why do you transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, honor your father and your mother, 
And he that curses his father or mother, let him die the death. But you say, whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, now this is a gift by which you may be profited by me. And he does not honor his father or mother, he will be innocent. Thus, you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. And so this is what was happening. As, as they were developing the special cases and so forth, uh, and by which they were really circumventing what the law actually said. And, and they were beginning to teach their traditions as commandments of God. And so Jesus said, they worship me in vain for they teach the doctrine, for doctrine, the commandments of men. So the new commandment is really just the reiterating of the original commandment. And that is love God with all your heart, mind and soul, love your neighbor as yourself. Getting back to the simplicity in Deuteronomy, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Leviticus 19, 18, you shall not seek revenge nor bear any grudge against your brother, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so the truth is love is the key and it is the answer and it is the proof that I am truly abiding in Christ. They had become so interested in interpreting the law that they had gone into darkness and they missed the essence of the message. But John is saying that the darkness is past. The true light is now shining. Jesus came to dispel the darkness. He came as the light of the world to bring truth, the truth of God. And what is the truth of God that Jesus taught? God is love. So John tells us in verse 9, He that saith he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. So how can I know? How can I be sure? Well, I can't really be sure by listening to myself because I might be saying the right things. And by virtue of the fact that I'm saying the right things, I can deceive myself. It isn't in what I say. It is in how I react in what I do. So if I say that I'm in the light, that's a wonderful thing. But if in the same token, I hate my brother, I am in darkness even until now. John is telling us that the darkness is past. The true light is shining. And if I say I'm in that light and yet I'm hating my brother, I'm in darkness. In verse 11, John describes the extent of the darkness. He said he is walking in darkness. That is, there is a mental darkness. He is blind to the truth. He feels that he is all right because he is saying the right things, when in reality he is not. He rationalizes his hatred and seeks to deny it in words. I've heard a person say, oh, but I love them. <laughs> Not so. The attitude, the actions say something entirely different. You might in your words say, I love them. But you show much different in the way you treat them or the attitude that you have toward them. As I was preparing 
for this study tonight and reading these scriptures, studying them prayerfully. The Lord began to put me under conviction because of a certain situation brought about by a fellow. I had to face the truth that I really hate him. And if I heard that something bad happened, like he had a heart attack and died, I would rejoice. <laughs> and the Lord really began to deal with me on this. Because you're going to go there and talk about love and not hating and all, and yet uh, for this particular fellow and in this particular situation, I can say, oh, well, I, I love him, but that wouldn't be so. I really resent what he has done, what he is doing. And so the Lord really dealt with me, and he is still dealing with me. I can't stand here tonight and say, oh, well, I love him. I can, but it's not true. And so the Lord's been dealing with me on it, and it's going to take some more dealing before I get there, but by the grace of God, I'm going to get there. By the grace of God, I'm going to love. I can't say that I do right now, but with God's help, I know that I shall, because I want God to work out in me his perfect love. But a person who says he's in in the light and hates his brother is in darkness, John said, even till now. He doesn't know where he is going. That is, he's in darkness. He doesn't know where he's going. We can be so deceived by our words that we really don't perceive the truth. It is interesting that people can actually be going contrary to the word of God and yet feel that they are all right. Look at Paul the Apostle. He was persecuting the church. He was causing the Christians to deny Jesus, forcing them to blaspheme, consenting to their deaths. And yet he was so deceived, he thought that he was doing God's will and God's work, though he had this tremendous hatred against anyone who believed that Jesus was the promised Messiah. Thankfully, the Lord woke Paul up, but uh, he was really doing what he felt was God's will. And it is possible for a person to be so deceived that they really feel that they are all right and that, uh, you know, because they can say, well, I love him, but, and, and, I've heard that so many. Well, I really love them, but. Uh, I don't know that there are any buts to the true love. He tells us in verse 11, the darkness has blinded his eyes. First of all, he's walking in darkness. He doesn't know where he's going, and the darkness has blinded his eyes. In chapter 3, Verse 1, John wrote, But whosoever has the world's goods and sees his brother has needs and shuts up his compassion from him, how dwells the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deeds and in truth. Easy to say, 
I love you. That's words. But we need to show it in our deeds, in truth. Uh, we used to have a fellow around here that was constantly coming up and saying, oh, I love you so much. And what was it, Shakespeare's that said, thou protesteth too much? You start getting a little suspicious when a person is uh, gushy in words all of the time. And yet they can stab you in the back declaring their love for you. And, and it just, it doesn't add up. That's not what love is about. James, of course, is so practical. He said, what does it profit, brothers? If a man says he has faith, and it isn't shown by his works. Can his faith, that is just verbal faith, I have faith, can that save him? If a brother or a sister is naked, destitute of daily food, and one of you say to them, depart in peace, be warm, be filled, and you do not give them those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit them? Love shows its true self in deeds and not in words. John goes on to say, he that loves his brother abides in the light and there is no occasion for stumbling in him. If you're hating, you're in darkness. But he who loves abides in the light. Now, we see three stages of light here in 1 John. In verse 7 of chapter 1, if we walk in the light. And in chapter 2, verse 9, uh, if we say that we are in the light. And then finally, Verse 10, if we abide in the light. In contrast, the man who hates his brother is in darkness. Verse 11, he walks in darkness. He doesn't know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. And do you know there is nothing quite so blinding as hatred? When there is hatred in your heart, your whole judgment is clouded. You cannot rationally judge a situation because you are looking at that situation through distorted eyes that result from your hatred. So it may be that a person is making a genuine appeal to you for forgiveness. But because you are filled with hatred towards them, you mistranslate that appeal for forgiveness as just a ruse on their part. You judge them. They're not truly sincere. They've got something up their sleeve. They really don't want to make peace. They're, they're, I'm just going to watch and you have to be careful. And, and, and you are perhaps just misjudging them completely because hatred has an effect of blinding your eyes, creating such prejudice in your heart that you can't truly have an honest kind of a relationship or uh, a true feeling towards them, blinded and distorted by hatred. John tells us, he that hates his brother is in darkness. He walks in darkness. 
He doesn't know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. And how tragic it is to see a person who is in that state, who is deceived, who is blind to the truth, who is resting in a false kind of a security, feeling that because he says that he loves, because he can say that he is in the light, that it necessarily follows that he does love and is in the light. When in reality, the way he is living, his actions, his attitudes, declare something completely different. How often in the scriptures we are warned about self-deception. He deceiveth himself. The truth isn't in him. And it is so easy, it seems, to deceive ourselves by listening to what we say. And because we have learned to say the right things, we somehow think that the words make up for Reality and they don't create reality. And so John is very careful to point us to not just affirming, but to looking for evidence. And the evidence that we need to look for is the genuine love that the Lord commands that we have for Him, Him first. Loving him more than anything else. And, and haven't we all said that I love the Lord more than anything in all of the world? And, and yet our, our, lives, our, our lives don't really demonstrate that many times. There are many things of the world that we find really have our attention and have our interests much more than the things of God. Let's not love in word, but let's love in deed and in truth. Father, help us. We don't want to be deceived. We don't want to just be saying the right things. Lord, we want to be doing the right things. And so we ask, Lord, that you will... Help us in this realm of love that we might in deed, in truth, love you supremely with all of our hearts, mind, strength. And help us, Lord, that we might love our brothers. In a genuine, true love even as we love ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we stand? Well, I preach myself under conviction. I don't know about you. <laughs> but the pastors are down here to pray for you. And when the Spirit is speaking to your heart, the best thing to do is get it resolved. Just go to the Lord and say, Lord, be honest, be honest. I need your help. I, I'm bearing this bitterness. I have this animosity. I'm really upset. And I can't truly say that I love them. But Lord, I know that you want me to. And so I need your help, Lord. And please help me. Now... <laughs> As I said, I'm working out this one with this one fellow right now. And, and I'm sure that the Lord is going to give me victory. Um, because he has done it in the past. This isn't the first guy I've hated. But I have found that as the Lord 
makes me aware. I've, I've always said it's sort of like, the first thing is the Lord makes you aware of, of, of an issue. And that's important. Until you're aware of it, you're not going to do anything about it. Once you become aware of it, then you can begin to work on it. And I have always looked at when the Lord makes me aware, it's like he puts up under construction signs. And he begins his work in my heart and in my life, transforming me, changing me. And I love it as God works in me. Does for me what I can't do for myself. With all of my attempt at mesmerizing myself and saying, well, I, well, I guess I don't really hate him. I, I guess, well, maybe, oh, I do hate him, but maybe <laughs> not that much, you know. And, and it's, it's sort of working out in me. And I can confess to you that there have been those that in the past I had this kind of hatred and God has changed it and I can honestly say I love them. And I, I, I like that when God has done that work in me and, and he's faithful. If I'm willing, he is faithful and he will help me and uh, he will help you. So, Just remember that it isn't what you see. It's what's in your heart that God sees. And he knows. And he wants to transform if we'll give him the chance. I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice to worship. Oh, my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in 